What an amazing crowd. Hello. Thank you so much. This is fantastic. I'm so happy you're here, and I'm so happy you're here, and that I get to be sitting with you. Uh, OK, so I'd just like to start out with um, asking you a question This might be a little unfair. Can you describe um, the series, the last thing you told me, in two sentences? <laughs> and you have to, like, one sentence, one sentence. No, you can do it each, but just to give a little synopsis. We can do one sentence, one sentence. Yeah, We're yeah. not scared of the challenge, <laughs> Lorraine. <laughs> Just, you know. Um, OK. A woman and her grumpy stepdaughter are faced with the heartbreak of a missing husband slash father. Yes. Who leaves in his wake only a mysterious note, protect her and no other instructions, and he's gone. What's to be done? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so um, can we start out talking about the challenges and the joys of adapting a book to a television series? So for me, so, many, so much of the challenge was in writing the book. It was a 10-year process. Um, I put the book down so many times that I wrote two additional books that were published over the interim of writing this book. Um, so by the time it came out into the world and I was adapting it with my husband and with this really wonderful small group of brilliant writers who were so excited to expand it and move it in new directions, I was so happy to be in the water with other people that it was really kind of joyful. Um, and then we got the glorious good fortune of Jen signing on early. And we would sit in the backyard together and read the scripts and go over them and hear the dialogue and hear how it all felt. And going from you know being in my room alone in pajamas writing to that, um, you know, to moving downstairs and outside <laughs> was really Pretty, pretty amazing. That's incredibly inspiring, I have to say. Um, and in terms of your involvement in the project, I heard you talking backstage about you've read the book like five billion times. Can you just talk about what brought you in? Well, I'm a reader, and I still um, read to my kids. I have 11, 14, 17-year-olds. My 17-year-old stays up too late. I can't. But my 14-year-old and I still read at night. And um, this was an unlikely bedtime tale. Um, but you know, it's not that far from the grim fairy tales, right? I mean, it's a little scary, a little dragon. Um, so we, we read it aloud together and whipped through the pages. It was just like, you know, Laura finishes every other chapter on a single sentence that changes everything you thought you knew. And you are compelled to keep going. That's why it's such a fun book to recommend to people, because you know that they are going to start and not put it down, and they're going to feel all the feelings and be wholly satisfied. Well, we had that just as readers. And it didn't even occur to me. I just was like, gosh, man, what a story. What a relation set of relationships. Man, something to dive into. But somebody else was attached, and I just didn't even think of it. Because um, someone else was Julia Roberts. Let's face facts. It's not like I was like, I'm going to take on Julia Roberts. No, no. Um, respect. Anyway, um, when scheduling snafus got in her way, I kind of went bananas and um, just stayed up all night and tried to write one good literate letter to um, the head of Apple and <laughs> uh, kind of sprinkled a couple around town. And eventually, they just, I think, were just like, oh, let's give it to the girl. What are we going to do? She's so annoying. But um, that's how I came to it. And then I read it. Um, I, I just, I felt like I've never had ri more rich source material in my life. <laughs> and um, sorry, Shakespeare, but 
I, I went back to the book over and over and over again. And honestly, the words would play in a refrain in my head as I was silent in the scene. Like um, the scene where I've just made the pasta from Poggio and Bailey goes storming out. Every time she walked out, I would think, and she's left with enough burnt pasta for a family of 10. I can just remember that, like every single take. And I don't know if it gave me anything, but it gave me something personally, just joy of seeing, you know, getting to play out words that I was so in, enraptured with. And as you we were saying, like at the end of each chapter, there's something that twists, and oh my gosh, this is gonna go someplace totally different. Your process as a writer, when you're going into it, like are you an outliner, or do you know where you're going? No, she doesn't. <laughs> do you know where the hell you're going? No, do you know where you're going? I, I, I know so little about where I'm going. So I always start with a question, and I have um, actually um, above my desk, well now I have a new desk, so on my desk, um, I have a quote from E.L. Doctorow that says, writing a novel is like driving a car at night. You have to see, you can see it as far out as your headlights, but you don't have to see further than that. And I think I attached to that in graduate school a little too strongly. So I sort of know what's happening in the next 10 pages. I, I started with this book with the question of, can we ever know the people we love? And all I knew going in was that a woman was answering the door to an unlikely messenger who was gonna deliver a message to her that changed everything about the man she loved the most. Um, the man that the woman loved the most, not the messenger. <laughs> so did you, it sounds like you two worked together as this, okay, so while you're imagining how you're going to play this character, is it daunting that you're sitting with the author who created her, or does it put another kind of pressure on it than it would if you just came into it as a script that was not attached to a book? No, because Laura gave me wholeheartedly Hannah from the minute she was mine. She has been nothing but an open book. Like the other night, I texted Laura and said, I'm doing something, but I'll need to, I'm using the book, but I'm gonna need to edit to be really distill down this one little moment, but I don't wanna do that without your permission because they're, you know, they're your words. And Laura wrote back and said, they're your words. Do what, do what you will. And that has been the case from the beginning and it felt, she, she and Josh, and Josh Singer, by the way, it's not like he's like, oh, my husband, Josh Singer, my husband, Academy Award winning writer, Josh Singer, who wrote you know, Spotlight and The Post and First Man and West Wing and all that, you know, he's amazing. So the two of them together are a pretty dynamic duo and they were the mom and dad of the, the job for sure and offered different kinds of, um, you know, encouragement, comfort, stability, challenge, but overall they both offered, this is your role, what are you gonna make of it and let's co-create from here on. And just uh, through this whole series, um, Hannah's dealing with a 16-year-old, a surly teen, and it seems like you have experience with this because <laughs> I was watching this going, yes, I have a teenager and I, I know what that looks like. Um, but I love this whole idea of this intensity and this crazy story um, pitted against trying to parent a teen. And you pull that off so well while keeping it a thriller. Because as I was talking to you about backstage, also the physicality of it, you're running, it's like there's such urgency there. Well, I do have teenagers, and the difference is my teenagers are mine. So their surliness I've earned. <laughs> I put it there. Um, and it is really short-lived, and they're really pretty sparkly and adorable most of the time, um, by far. Bailey is mean. <laughs> Bailey is like, really, she has this person who's entered her life that she doesn't want. She is a victim of this circumstance. And H Hannah never expected to be a mom, didn't have a mom, knows nothing about being a mom, is clunky as hell, and just <laughs> steps in it over and over and over again. So it's, the hard thing for me was not playing it like they're my own teenagers who need a joke and a cuddle and a, or, you know, or a slowly step away, but, but play, to play it as someone who doesn't know how to deal with the child in front of yeah. them. And, um, 
Your initial idea for this, I read an interview with you where you said it came from the Enron scandal. Can you talk about that? That's like so fascinating. So I, um, I'm very interested historically in true crime and the Enron trial, I was subsumed by it. I don't know what it was. I think it was this mix of hubris and pathos and all the complicated emotions of how do you start in this place and end up over here? But the thing that resonated for me the most was that I saw an interview with Linda Lay, the wife of Kenneth Lay, the CEO of Enron, in which she essentially said, my husband's done nothing wrong. And I was captivated by that moment. And I started then in 2003 to imagine a woman who found herself in the position where she thought her husband was someone that was categorically different from who the world was telling her he was. And what does that look like and what does that feel like? And I ruminated on that for a long time and then I saw another interview in which, uh, uh, funny enough, one of our executive producers, the wonderful Reese Witherspoon, uh, was talking about how important it is, it was a Gloria Steinem quote that she used in this interview, um, for women to watch other women be the hero of their own lives. And something about marrying those two concepts really crystallized for me a story that I wanted to tell. I wanted to look at a woman who believes something but was not the victim of that belief, but rather the hero of that belief. And what would that look like? And that's when I put pen to paper. Um, I'm going to get to questions from the audience in a, in a minute, but I just want to ask you, is there advice that you would give to aspiring novelists out there and also um, to aspiring performers, actors? Is what, I'm, you know, when people ask me this as a journalist, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry I just did this to you, but please, <laughs> do you have advice? So my, my, I have a, a two-tier system of advice, because the first tier of the system is about the writing itself. And that is that, and it was advice that I was given at 22 years old by a wonderful writer named Antonia Nelson, who I took a writing class with in Taos, New Mexico. Um, and uh, she's, she's wonderful, um, and I highly recommend uh, her, her work. And she said, you have to love the writing. And I didn't even understand at the time how true that was. But she said, publishing looks a lot like a box of books showing up at your house one day. And you open the box. And then your kids ask you what's for dinner. And you have to take out the trash. So you better really like the work. And I feel very lucky that I love the work. But that was a real um, watershed moment for me because it made me think, how much do I like the work? If no one ever reads this, if five people read it, is it gonna be something that was really worth doing? And my answer was always categorically yes. And to that end, to make the work more enjoyable, this is the second tier, I highly recommend two books that sit by my desk all these years. One is On Writing by Stephen King, and the other is Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. And whenever I feel stuck or I'm having a day where I'm not enjoying the writing, I sit and I read those books again and I find my way back into it. Um, I guess I would say, and I haven't been asked this for a while, but I think that acting is such a time of, it's just, it's such a weird career and such a weird thing to try to get into. And it took me years and years and years. I mean, I was working in summer stock, building the sets and, and unclogging the toilets between, between shows and um, you know helping to clean the wardrobe, whatever. For a, a long time, I, I did that and worked my way up in theater and ended up you know on a left hook in front of a camera. But what I would say is that when I was first starting out, my girlfriend, Jean Louisa Kelly, remember her, Mr. Holland's Opus? I mean, she's wonderful. But she and I used to say to each other when we were fallow, we'd say, what are you doing today? What are you, what, what are you inputting? What are you, because you have to take in art to put it out. You have to make yourself go to the Getty and stand there and look out. You have to read a lot. You have to see things. You have to see plays. You have to see whatever it is that inspires you, but make it a point. I mean, I, when I lived in New York, I stood in the back for $20 and leaned against just to watch plays because it was the only way I could afford to do it. But I wouldn't trade one of those experiences. That's 
really what it's about. And then otherwise, you have to love the, the work of auditioning, and you have to prep for it like it is the scene that you're showing up to do on a Monday morning on the last thing you told me. It really, that's your chance to act that day. So you've got to love it.